My Life as a Celebrity Lookalike is the real life telling of Stephen Sims' journey of looking like Jonah Hill from 2007 to 2010. This podcast has been created to share the unique story of looking like a celebrity lookalike. In no way has this podcast been created to disparage, humiliate, or destroy Jonah Hill. And here we are, My Life as a Celebrity Lookalike, the podcast that tells you what it's like to be a celebrity lookalike. Josh Larkin, how are you? Good. Always happy to relive the best memories that 2007 has to offer with you. Thank you so much for being here, Josh. Um, we, we've had an exciting first two episodes. First episode with our guest, Allison Trumbull, and second episode with our guest, Michael Roach, who's actually going to be joining us again shortly. And to get everyone up to speed on where we're at, you know, in the timeline, you know, it's early 2007. I've moved to Los Angeles from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I moved there with my buddy, Mike Roach. We just discovered who Jonah Hill was by seeing him on a billboard. And Roach has come up with an idea for a short film. I mean, at the time, we didn't know it was a short film. We didn't know what it was. But it's what we later would call Destroying Jonah Hill. We're going to talk today with Michael Roach and Dylan Stern, both who were producers on Destroying Jonah Hill. Dylan directed it. He also held the boom mic, if I remember correctly. That's how we did things back then. But before we get to Roach and Dylan, I just want to let the audience know what Destroying Jonah Hill is by letting Josh describe it. So today we actually sat down and I got to watch all of it, and it's like what they do now where they show you like the first eight minutes of a movie online and then it cuts with like that teaser. That's exactly what this is. This is the tease of a short film uh, where you and Roach are basically yourself. And I barely know Dave Brock and Dave Brock is also himself in this movie. I know I would like to say we are versions of ourselves now that we're, you know, 13 years older, I'd like to look back and some of the language we used and references we made that we were, again, fictitious versions of ourselves. Yes, you are your parodies of yourself. You are clearly more ignorant, dumbed down versions of yourself to to move the story in the direction that it needs to go. But yeah, it's the it's the tease of you and Roach going and, and doing this. And there's a good bit of dicks in there which lines up with the plot of Superbad. Uh, you have an affinity to draw dicks in destroying Jonah Hill, which you weren't aware of was even in Superbad, if I know. No, we weren't aware of that because we filmed those scenes the week before Superbad came out, and we'll talk about that with Roach and Dylan. But yeah, we made a short film called Destroying Jonah Hill in August 2007. It was directed by my good friend Dylan Stern. It was produced by myself and Michael Roach. Michael Roach was the lead writer on it, and by writing... We wrote a lot of this the morning of, but we'll get to that right now. Let's introduce our guest. He's back. Ladies and gentlemen from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, my good friend, Michael Roach. Hey, Roach. Hey, guys. How's it going? Roach has the great, the best bits in the whole film, and we'll talk about that in a second. But Roach, thanks for being back on the podcast. I know we talked about our journey to LA last time and discovering who Jonah Hill was, but this time around, we're going to talk about the making and... <laughs> I don't think distribution is the right word of destroying Jonah Hill, the unsolicited distribution of destroying Jonah Hill. Um, but before we get into it, I want to bring out uh, our other guests. He directed destroying Jonah Hill. We've gone on to make many projects with him. He's a good friend of mine. I work with him to, to this day, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dylan Stern. Hey, Dylan. Hey guys. Well, that's what we should start with, with Dylan. I mean, we, you know, if you haven't picked up already, I'm in the film as a version of Steven Sims. Roach is in the film as a version of Michael Roach. Dylan is behind the camera, essentially directing, uh, or what we thought directing was then. And as well as directing, you were holding the boom mic, right? A lot of the times, yes. And that's kind of how we made our projects back. Not kind of, that is how we made our projects back then. I mean, we would have one person calling camera but at the same time you know holding a boom or holding a camera or whatever it is you have to do and 
I think the only people we had on set, Josh, besides the actors, were Dylan and our camera operator, Brad, who we'll talk about shortly. Uh, I was going to ask whether this was a two camera shoot or a one camera shoot where Dylan just had to sidestep left and right to get these shots. Brad was the crew. I was the crew. I assume you and Roach were also the crew and probably Dave Brock was the crew. It really was just and maybe even Will also. It was just all of us kind of hanging out for the weekend at Fast Signs and making a movie. And, you know, Josh asked if it was a single camera or a uh, two camera shoot. It was almost a no camera shoot. And Roach <laughs> brought this. Roach brought this up on the last episode. Uh, I mean, Brad, who was living with us, he's the reason we had the camera. <laughs> essentially, <laughs> didn't he tease about having this camera for the longest time? And then when it came to do the shoot, he didn't actually have a camera, and we had to go to Best Buy to buy the camera. Was is that true? Uh, he might have went to Best Buy. I don't remember going to Best Buy, but that's something I could see you guys doing behind my back because I would have blown a gasket. I think there was drama in that he kept talking about this. It was like the Panasonic HVX or whatever, and he kept saying that he had this camera, but nobody had ever seen this camera. And then like the day of the shoot, he showed up with the camera, so must have just gone out to buy it <laughs> that morning. <laughs> I remember seeing a camera box in the backseat of his car that morning while you were being in a Best Buy bag. Roach, do you remember it all? I remember that he kept saying that he had the camera and that his mom had to send it out to him. And like that went on for about a month. And we kept saying, well, when is she going to send it? And like, oh, yeah, she's, she's about to. She's about to. And then. I don't remember any packages arriving. I just remember him all of a sudden having the camera and we were shooting B-roll at one point and he was playing with the camera settings. He was playing with slow motion and you could tell he had never touched this camera before in his life and he was trying to figure out how, it, like all the cool little things it did. But he definitely bought it somewhere. Yeah, I I, I remember, we all have different stories, but I remember him telling us that there was this guy named duck who he was working with as he was an intern uh here in la and that duck was going to give him the camera but i i never met anyone named duck i think it's highly likely that you all got different versions of the story because that's how you cover your tracks best if nobody can pin down where the lie is we're still trying to figure it out all these years later but he showed up with the camera at least he did show up with the camera and you know he showed up with more than just a camera which we'll get to on episode four but uh Brad was our camera operator, and the one thing I remember specifically was he wore flip-flops the day of the shoot. <laughs> you were so mad about that. You, you don't wear open-toed shoes on set, let alone if you're the cinematographer shooting a, a handheld style project. I love how you have all these rules for a gorilla style shoot that you co-opted on McDonald's sidewalk. And Dylan, do you remember the first time you heard about the idea, like from Roach and I? I do, yeah. I, di I didn't know Sims and Roach very well, and I certainly didn't know Brad. Um, Sims and I had met maybe six months earlier. I was living in Pittsburgh. Um, we were both doing like grip PA work for a local KDK news company, like making commercials, local commercials. And... I think I had met Sims twice and it was like, we're talking about like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I was mentioning that I was moving to LA. He also mentioned that he was thinking of moving out to LA at some point. We exchanged numbers and that was sort of the end of it until flash forward six months later, he calls me. He's like, Hey, I'm in LA. We started hanging out. You guys came to a party at our house. This was an Eagle rock. And that may have been the first time I met Roach. And that's when it was pitched to me because I had never heard of Superbad. I didn't know anything about it until you guys pitched it, pitched it to me at that party. Roach, were you like, yeah, we're going to a big Hollywood party and we're going to pitch this big time director and this is our break? <laughs> yeah. It's like, like, you know, being new to L.A. and not understanding like, oh, we're going to a party at somebody's house. Like you're thinking, all right, you know, this is, you know, we'll take 10 minutes, drive over there, have a party. It's like we were on opposite sides. <laughs> of the city. It was like as far away as you could drive. It took us over an hour to get there. 
<laughs> that was the day Roach decided he never was passing the uh, the 110 freeway or La Brea or whatever yeah. it is that your line was. Staying west of Fairfax. Um, <laughs> but really, like the first day of shooting, I think that was maybe the fourth time I had met you, Sims. It, we, we even joked about that that day, the fourth time we were hanging out. Because I remember like sitting at Fast Signs after the shoot or the night before the shoot as we were prepping and being like, wow, like the, someone was like, how do you guys know each other? And Dylan told that exact story. But the Eagle Rock house is funny because we had Allison on our first episode and Allison Trumbull, she recalls hearing about it at an Eagle Rock party as well, too, from Dylan. And it very well could have been the same party that we were there pitching this because I re- remember we I think we were going to have Allison play the role of Liz in the film, but she was unavailable and we went with Anna because there was no casting process, Josh. I mean, there was still, (laughs) there was, I I was led to believe that there may not have been, I think Gil, Gil was very committed, but well, so Dave Brock was, I guess he wasn't really even my roommate at the time. I had known Dave maybe a week as well because he had just moved to LA and was staying on our couch, like, you know, just showed up in LA looking for places to live. And it was like, Hey, we're doing this thing. Do you want to be a part of it? And he's like, fuck, I don't care. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and then will, I was taking classes at doing UCB uh, 101 classes at the time. And will was in my class. So I just met him as well. And it was just sort of this, everyone coming together for the first time to do this project. It was a summer camp film where you guys like, yeah, you guys all get together and, you know, go your own ways afterwards. But for a couple of weekends, you know, it's the, the highlight of summer. Well, I think it's it solidified our friendship for sure. I mean, Dylan and I definitely hung out more than four times after that. Uh, probably saw <laughs> this, four times this, this is week. the seventh time. <laughs> yeah, this is the seventh time we've hung it's out. Good to see you again, Sims. <laughs> yeah, good seeing you. Thanks for getting on the pod. Uh, yeah, so you know, Dylan was a huge part. And how did you know Anna? She was a girl that I had a crush on and wanted to date, <laughs> more or less. I had met her through. I, I don't actually remember where or how I met her, but it was just one of those. I'm talking to a girl let's get her involved. I think she, I don't know if she was an actress or quasi was thinking about being an actress, but it was just like, don't know many girls. Here's someone I'm talking to. Let's get her in the film. (laughs) Yeah. uh, I mean, Roach, I don't want to speak for you, but I don't think we, I mean, there was Liz, the bartender that we named the character after, but we didn't have that many females in our life. And yeah, the the ninety West uh, wasn't really a hotbed of uh, you know activity. It was basically the the local bums who lived right around the corner, and that was it. And us being two of those bums, <laughs> exactly. I assume I assume we would have asked Allison to be in it first. When we spoke to Allison two episodes ago, I remember thinking she was unavailable or she had a class or another gig probably i mean whatever she did was probably much more significantly more (laughs) paying work (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, paying gig (laughs) but one of the things i remember was i remember dylan you were a production assistant uh a pa at the time and i remember like the weekend of or the days leading up to it you were doing a music video with billy corgan and you know roach and i were working at fast signs culver city and that was kind of a cool thing to know, like the guy that was like coming on to work on our sh- short film with us is working with Billy Corgan. <laughs> well, I got him breakfast like he's a vegan. And, you know, it's one of those when you're a PA, you run around and do a bunch of crazy, weird jobs. And uh, I remember having to go pick up breakfast for Billy Corgan, which, you know, at the time you're like, oh, my God, this is so amazing. Like I'm driving. I'm driving. I'm being inconvenienced to drive and pick up breakfast and bring it back like and not even interacting with them. Just like I, I got the box of food. Here you go. <laughs> and someone else gives it to him. Well, it was pretty amazing at the time. Um, we talked on this the last episode with Roach and I want to bring this up again because we're obviously we can't remember what we filmed first, but I do believe Dylan is right. We filmed the, the McDonald's scene first because the billboard was probably coming down. But Roach, you had it in your notes uh, from 2007 
that it was over the course of two weekends, and the first weekend was the week before Superbad? August 11th, 2007. And Superbad, I believe, came out on August 17th, 2007. Uh, and again, you know, we do the scene with the dicks, do multiple scenes with animated dicks. And that was all before we saw Superbad, which is kind of interesting and, you know, very relatable. Seeing that we premiered Destroy Jonah Hill nine months after Superbad came out, it seemed like a big ripoff. I have um, I have my notes. I have in my email all the Destroying Jonah Hill emails. Re- let's let's I hear have some. De- destroying Jonah Hill production notes, 81407. Weekend shoot schedule, August 17th, 2007, August 18th, 2007. So Saturday, August 18th, scene two, the freak out fast signs fillers. We actually had notes? Yeah. Location, fast signs, Culver City, time, morning, afternoon, setups, alley, garage area. Scenes will be broken out later this week. Inside store, variety of filler shots. Possible Dylan and Julia improv scene. Dylan also works at Fast Science. I was going to be in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> July 22nd, 2007 is the first email I have from you about this. And it says, Randy Newman screaming, we love it. <laughs> That's the subject line. <laughs> Fellas, attached are the notes. I hope you both are having wonderful weekends. If not, maybe these notes will help. My sister is here until Tuesday. So from Wednesday on, I am free to get together to work on the script for the short. Brad will be preoccupied with his lady friend until next weekend. So. We got some time to knock this bitch out. Not his lady friend, the script. Talks. <laughs> <laughs> that email's funnier than the actual script. <laughs> oh, and then you have the first notes. Like, it seems like the version of this was much different. The notes from July 2007, the audition scenario one Sims is auditioning for a B level commercial. Casting agents think Sims is Hill. Shocked that Jonah Hill would audition with him. We had the billboard scene in here, it looks like. Sims is wearing the shirt and walking across the street from the super bad billboard. Doesn't notice. The strip club. Sims and his entourage go to the popular strip club in LA. Was well, that, that just a reason for us to go to the strip club? Is that sounds valid? Probably. Immediate, immediately upon arrival, the strip club staff assumes that Sims is Hill. Sims gets treated to Jonah Hill's regular strip club experience. So we must have, I do remember that we had a few where we'd go to Denny's late at night and just kind of talk through scenarios. So this must have been, we would talk and jot down notes and then figure out what's possible. And then in the end, it's like, well, we only have access to fast science. <laughs> so let's make it that. I vaguely remember, I remember going to Denny's, obviously, but I vaguely remember talking about the stuff through which do you have any recollection i mean i know we were putting stuff together for a bigger piece in, re- in, in which kind of re- is in reference to what josh said that was like the intro to a movie yeah i remember it was you know, and looking over these emails like there are emails about the fleshing out of it that never happened it was gonna be it was very ambitious <laughs> especially considering what it actually turned you know what we finished was and it, but looking at these emails like Brad was back in Pittsburgh August 28th at, at, at the at the latest. So, I mean, he basically like this all happened like within a couple of weeks and then he had to go back to school or whatever. So it's like we had the camera for a couple of weeks. We filmed what we could film and then it was like <laughs> gone. It was all just the end of August. We stole all the music, of course. <laughs> you know, we don't actually own the rights to Spoon's uh, underdog. I've always thought that, I mean, we had to have been the first production to stick that in in a, in some, I mean, not that this was a, you know, anything, anyone ever saw this, but like that song became very popular as a trailer song or a, in a movie. Kind of, and like we, I mean, that it, it probably been out for maybe two months at that point. You Less know. than that. I think it had just come out. It probably came out of July of that year. And yeah, I feel like we were the first people to really push that. Not that anyone cares. Not that anyone cares. But to this day, if my mom hears that song, I was with her once at a store a few years ago and Underdog by Spoon was playing. And she goes, oh, it's the Destroying Jonah Hill song. And, you know, I mean, you know, Roach makes a good point. No one cared and it didn't. <laughs> didn't move the mark by any means but we were the first ones to actually really utilize that song which was used in a ton of movies and trailers after that 
So my question, the movie opens with a voicemail from a guy named Chuckles. And he's telling you that, hey, Sims, you look like the guy from Superbad. Like, now I got to go to the Marines. Is that a real voicemail that you got? That was a real voicemail that I received from my college buddy, Charlie Sears. Do you remember Charlie Sears, Josh? Did you ever meet him? I do remember Chuckles. I didn't know him as Charlie Sears, but I do remember briefly meeting Chuckles over at a Phi Delta party before I had gone. I think it might have been a Halloween party even. That makes sense. Yeah, I got a, you know, maybe like the week before we filmed Destroying Jonah Hill or the week of, I randomly got a voicemail from Chuckles saying he was going to the Marines. And for some reason, we just thought it was so great. And I just, I figured he was going to the Marines during the time of like George Bush's war. So I was like, let's at least honor Chuckles. And again, this is the only thing we do. Let's put Chuckles voicemail in it. So the other question was, because you, you and Roach, obviously this was your story and your movie. Like, was that something Sims that happened to you a lot? Were you getting recognized from the billboard? Is that where the movie came from? Because at that point, Jonah Hill was virtually unknown you know had done a little bit of movies but he wasn't a household name and it really was for a month before super bad came out like those posters were everywhere i mean i think that's really what it came down to we talked about this on our last episode with roach uh, how i was at the movies i saw the jonah hill billboard with my friend julia she made a reference i went back roach and i were walking to the 90 west the bar we hung out at and roach just says it's crazy you came out here to do this stuff and he more or less beat you to it. And I, I mean, I'll let Roach take the credit because it, it was a light bulb idea that we came up that he came up with it just out of nowhere. And I guess we probably spent that night just talking about all those scenes that we ended up not filming. Roach, you have anything to add to that? No, that's, that's, that's how it went down. That's what I remember. I mean, you know, my rewatching it made me realize how much, I forgot about all of this. Like I forgot there were any females in this thing. I, yeah, like, I, forgot, I actually forgot that Anna was in the movie. <laughs> yeah. And then there's another girl who just reads a book the whole time. I have no idea who she is or where she came from. <laughs> I, I don't remember her name. I'd have to look at the credits again, but I shared this movie with Eli Braden, who is a, is a comedian and he writes for the Howard Stern show. And I shared it with him probably like two years ago. And Eli was like, oh, I couldn't believe you got so-and-so to be in your movie before they were a famous comedian. And that's who he's talking about. And that was Brad's friend that he worked with. So, again, I don't remember her name. It started with a K. I'll have to look at the credits. Um, but Brad brought in another female, and it was her. And supposedly she's gone on to be a fairly popular comedian. Was this a Kieran Deal? K-I-R-A-N-D-E-O-L. This is why we have Josh for the fact. Look checking. at me doing research here. Fucking pretty three producers on the show. What wh what has she been up to? Did you can you find out what she's going what she has going on? I mean, I could be totally wrong about this, but Oh, is that her Kieran Deal? Is that yeah, yeah that's, that's the only name. Yeah, that was as we were discussing. I mean, there's only eight people in the movie, like total. So as we were discussing this, the rest were eliminated, and I went through the credits here. And that's the missing link, I think. Does she have Destroying Jonah Hill on her IMDb? It does look, doesn't look like she does. I was going to ask you that, Dylan. Do you, uh, do you still put these credits on your resume? Are these, uh, are these still out there for you? You know, I'm not getting a lot of work as a director. So um, I, I, would, I think this probably is on, let's see if it's on my IMDb. I don't think it was on her IMDb because, again, we'll get to this in episode four. We had a problem with Brad making his own version of the film, and we didn't want to be affiliated with him. So we probably punished her. I mean, punished her. I mean, <laughs> hell, he's got off. She got off. Yeah, it looks like it looks like we punished her pretty good. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I feel like that's probably not the case. I, I think you were. <laughs> Sims, you were definitely very thorough with putting things on IMDb. I bet her people took it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, once they lock, once they launch that new show on Peacock, <laughs> they're, they 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 they're like, we gotta, we gotta. I'm gonna send her a tweet and be like, hey, by any chance, do you happen to remember this? The annoying thing is 
that we had a very talented comedian in our backyard and we didn't take advantage of her. We just let her read a book. (laughs) The one person who doesn't talk. (laughs) Well, that's what I, I I guess I didn't remember her being in the actual film until we watched it right now. So I thought she was just in the trailer, but yeah, Roach, I'm pretty sure you're right. I probably was very thorough about the IMDb credits and her team was probably very thorough, just like Jonah Hill a year later in making sure no one was affiliated with this film. Well, technically, she shouldn't be in the credits because she doesn't have a, a line. <laughs> you know, like you know, we we spotted her up with that credit anyway. <laughs> you, you did a lot of service to her career, I'm sure. <laughs> so the other question I have watching that in the film, you get Sims. Your character gets really angry really quick. Like scene two, you're like so pissed off, and I'm curious. Like, was there any anger? in real life towards the super bad thing? Like, was this something that you were actually upset about? Absolutely. And I think if, even if I didn't admit it then or said I would have been performing in the beginning of the trailer, which is still out there online, there's a quote from Judd Apatow that talks about comedy coming from anger. So I was angry, but Roach also pointed out last episode that I was in a bad head place the summer of 2007, like to the point where I almost left LA. And I think there was just a lot of emotions when we made that. And I also, I mean, to this day, I'm still an emotional lunatic, but I'm sure it was even more when I was 23. Yeah, and I think had you had access to the other places that you wanted to shoot, the film at least would have come across less angry, you know, like had you been able to shoot that version of it, where you take advantage of looking like Jonah Hill rather than the, you know, the very popular trend in 2007 of negging. Uh, I think, you know, it could have been a lot, a lot different. So what you're saying is if we had that strip club scene, I probably would have been a lot calmer. I think that would have really turned your, your whole emotional state around uh, in 2007. If you could have been around a plethora of naked women, because I think one would have really turned you on the right course. I think more than one would have set you up for the rest of the year. I think it was if he had just been away from uh, a cinematographer with open toed shoes during the shoot, like that just like had the constant, I'm mad the entire shoot. Like I have to deal with this guy. <laughs> Or they were flip flops too. They weren't even like Birkenstocks. There was no back. <laughs> He's still carrying the aggression over that. That's therapy this week. It's him sits down. like, I got to talk about these flip flops. Before we move on off the films, I want to talk about a couple of the things before we wrap up. Does anyone else have any comments or questions regarding this cinematic masterpiece? No, but I just want to add, you know, I think watching it, you know, it, it it does feel like we were trying to create something in the tone of a Judd Apatow movie. And I actually think some of the Judd Apatow movies that have come afterward in that universe, you know, like it feels very much a tribute to that sort of genre. And it doesn't feel like a, we hate Jonah Hill. We want to take this guy down. And I think if we would have had the opportunity to make the feature that we wanted to, I think that would have come through, you know, that in the end, there would have been more of a acceptance of this other person who looks exactly like you. And it is maybe not showcased as well as it could be within the short confines of the short film that we made in the span of two weekends. (laughs) Very true. And that goes to what Allison said, too, when she was on. If I could take five years, that first five years in L.A. and just not throw it away, but like rethink a lot of it because it takes you that five to seven years to kind of get acclimated. And I just didn't have the head space for, I mean, again, it all was so kismet and it led to great things, which we'll talk about. But in the summer of 2007, I was definitely angry. For me, what I take away from it is just the solidifying of these relationships that have been, you know, 13, 13 years now of, you know, starting with ma- making movies with my best friends, you know, and adding Dave in there and adding Will and just kind of getting to create this new family in LA because, you know, you do move so far from home and it felt very familiar 
for me of like relationships I had in college or even in high school to have that experience to be able to make movies with my friends. Roach, anything else to add on the film before we move on? No, it just brought back, you know, like what Dylan was saying, it brought back good memories of just kind of, I mean, they were long days. And I remember the first day started with like basically rewriting it. Like it was like Dylan and I were in, in the, uh, the printer room or, you know, the room next to the printer uh, early in the morning, trying to like make sense of what we were about to do for the day. I remember the, the Mac and me comment was like, kind of like, yeah, okay, that one works. Like, let's, let's keep that. But yeah, it was, it was fun. Um, in hindsight, it was tedious when doing it. I want to add one other thing. As part of a marketing campaign, we created stickers, destroying Jonah Hill stickers that had Sims looking, you know, looking up at the the sign. And I remember we were passing those out to people and like, it just, it felt like everywhere I would go, like I would see a destroying Jonah Hill sticker at somebody's random house because like we would have huge parties at the compound and it would basically be like passing out these stickers. And then you'd go around and just see destroying Jonah Hill stickers randomly. That's probably how it got back around to make him aware of it. Sims is, uh, you know, in the note that he sent over, he makes mention that his friend sent it to him. And it's probably knowing that there were stickers everywhere. His friend probably had seen a sticker and was like, oh, that's my buddy. What is that? And then we're like, oh, you got to check this out. That's exactly right. And that's actually a good way to to kind of wrap things up here is. Next episode, we're going to talk about exactly how Jonah Hill came into my life, Dylan's life, Roach's life in the fall of 2007. And it really starts with a note that we received. And Josh, I would love for you before we wrap things up to read the note that we received. Now, we re received this from Jonah Hill on Facebook on November 8th, 2007 at 2.51 a.m. And I'll just let Josh take it from there. Yeah, I appreciate you clarifying the timestamp on that. It's very important and also important that nothing is capitalized in this. Thanks for starting a page to destroy me. My friend sent me this today and I just wanted to say thank you. I know I've done so much personally to harm you and it's cool to know that my karma is coming back to get me. I totally deserve this page being around. This is all sarcasm in case you haven't gotten to that resolution yet. It's good to know that being cool to people and attempting to be funny and entertained can one day culminate in this. A bunch of people you never even met starting a web page wishing for your demise. Thanks again. Parentheses. Sarcasm. You know, it's funny. We talked about this off air with Roach briefly after the last episode. And I want to bring it up. There's a chance. This was... He's referring to a MySpace page. Okay, we didn't have a website. We didn't have, you know, anywhere to go. It was a MySpace page because that's what was going on in 2007, MySpace, or at least what we could afford with our $0 <laughs> budget. That's what but the budget allowed for was MySpace. Roach brought up that maybe Jonah just saw destroying Jonah Hill on the MySpace, didn't click the video link, didn't look at anything else, or just saw this sticker somewhere, like Dylan said, and at 2.51 a.m., November 2007, he wrote this lowercase message. Starting a web page to destroy him. So, yeah, it, it's under the interpretation that it's just an online web portal, an AOL fan club. But the opposite, you've started an AOL hate club for Jonah Hill. Huh? I have to think, though, at that time, you know, social media and access to celebrities obviously is a lot different now than it was then. And I'm sure for him, like having this success, overnight success of Superbad and now being a household name and then seeing, oh, these people have a website dedicated to destroying me. It wasn't like nowadays with Twitter, people go, you suck or Facebook, you suck. Like the access to celebrities wasn't there and this new technology was so new. And like you said we had a MySpace page. It wasn't like Facebook really was a household thing at that point either. So I'm sure it just became shocking to him that like, oh, I'm doing this funny thing. I'm trying to be a comedian. I have this movie and these jagoffs want to take me down. To that point, he could have saw the picture, which is me, and assumed it was him 
And again, just a bunch of jagoffs taking pictures of me, telling them how they want to destroy me. He to this day. Oh my gosh, it all comes so clear now. Maybe there's no reason for a podcast, but to this day, he's probably always just like that fucking jerk who had the website that hated me. <laughs> didn't even see the movie, didn't see the trailer. But there is a chance he could have saw a sticker or received a sticker. I mean, I gave him one at one point, and we're going to talk about that in the next episode when I met Jonah Hill three days after we received this message. But I do want to wrap things up, and uh, I want to go to Roach, see if Roach has any... You know, Roach has been a part of our last two episodes, huge part of 2007 with destroying Jonah Hill and me looking like Jonah Hill. Roach, anything to add? No, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing about how you met Jonah Hill three days after that message. I forgot about that story. There's so many stories that I've forgotten about that I've just kind of been digging into my brain to bring up. And every time they come up, I just want to vomit. And we'll get to that story on the next episode. Dylan, anything you want to add about destroying Jonah Hill or your time you know, in 2007 being a part of this craziness? No, I mean, watching that obviously has brought up a lot of memories. Um, I actually had forgotten that, that Jonah Hill had written that message to you or to us. Um, so yeah, I, lo- I actually also look forward to hearing more of the stories well, thank you both for being on the show. And uh, Josh, we hope in this third episode you learned a little more about me looking like Jonah Hill and the infamous cinematic genius of what was destroying Jonah Hill, which is out there. I'm glad I got to see the little bit of the, the actual film you guys were able to put together on this. Dylan, I appreciate you coming on and giving us the director's point of view on it and kind of joining our thruple from the last episode. And Roach, you actually wore the fast sign shirt. I don't think we addressed that, but I appreciate you actually dressing the part today as well. And for any fans of the pod, I will autograph that shirt. Roach will take it off his body. I'll autograph it and send it to you. Uh, just reach out to us. I'm Steven Sims along with Josh Larkin. Thanks to our guests, Michael Roach and Dylan Stern. This is my life as a celebrity lookalike. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.